Uh, Trey, T-R-E-Y-G-A-R-E-S, uh, Unibombers, singer, songwriter, guitarist. Okay. Or Vox, better. Put Vox. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, it's been, we're the longest continuous band. There's been bands that have uh, taken like a six or seven year hiatus and come back, but we're the, like the longest that never stop. Yeah. All right. And how have things changed? I mean, can you start with the year that you started until? We started in 95, uh, the winter of 95. And like when we came out, I didn't want to come half ass with it because it's really hard. Like uh, if you start off shitty, Am I allowed to curse on this? Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. oh all right. All right. If you start off shitty, you know, a lot of people are turned off, and it takes a lot for people to come back and check you out after that. So we busted our ass when we started, like, for six months, four or five days a week, practicing a few hours a day. So when we came out, we were dead on, you know, like, I mean, probably tired than we are now, to be honest. But uh, our first show was in June, on my birthday, June 8th of uh, 96, but we started in 95. We had a... Uh, First drummer was from Harlem. I met him through Skinny's, actually. Uh, Steve hooked me up with him, a guy named Carlos. And uh, he played with us for a year. And then we got Greg, and he's been there. Is that going to fuck it up? That's probably going to fuck it up. That's loud. It was a drummer from Harlem. Uh, from he's Harlem. A, yeah, Dominican guy, Carlos. Uh, he actually played with uh, Black Jesus for a little bit right before he met us. He played with them for a few months. And uh, we stayed together for a year. And that was a pretty nasty breakup. His drums ended up in a lake. Blood, cops, all that good stuff. You know, like, he was a really good friend. And sometimes it's hard to say bye or whatever. So he was, he was a Marine, too. So he's really macho. Well, ex-Marine. So he didn't know how to say goodbye to, like, his good friends. So he wanted to, like go out with the bang. He definitely went out with the motherfucking bang. Blood in, blood out, like one of those type deals. And then uh, I didn't really know Greg at the time. Like, uh, Greg was playing in a band. He was in a Seesaw, which we played with at the corner a few times. You know, I wasn't familiar with Dominic, so I was right before I moved here. But we did play the corner a lot when Billy was running it. And uh, Greg was in a band called Evil Superman, too. That's how I knew him. And uh, a friend of mine, well, you know Dave Allison, but uh, their lead singer was having trouble getting harassed. So uh, Dave came to me and you know, told me this, that the guy was you know, getting picked on or whatever. So even before I met the guy, I was like, I got the guys back. No one's ever going to fuck with this guy again before I met him. So I knew Greg a little bit. And then uh, my bass player, Greg Willis, was like, you know, we're trying to find uh, drummers. And uh, I looked at old videos of our shows and see this guy going crazy in the circle pit all the time. And it was Greg, Greg Wise. So, you know, that's how we picked them, because I've always been more like a personality guy over talent, you know, like, talent can come, you know, you can blend that, but you can't really teach personality. And when you're stuck in a van for, like, 15 fucking hours, you know, like, I don't care how talented you are, if you're a dick, you know, it's like, it's not going to work, you know. But Greg's been with me for 14 years, and that's, you know, that's, that's pretty much the whole root of it. Now, did you effectively train Greg? I mean, was Greg a drummer? Greg was a great drummer, but he wasn't. He'll disagree with me when I say this, but he wasn't really like a, uh, we were, I mean, we started off more like in the hardcore scene, I'd say, than like uh, the bar scene, but we were one of the few bands that would play both. Like we'd play, you know, Route 44 on a Saturday at two in the morning, but then we'd play like the skate park or uh, there used to be a, a venue up here on the corner of Llewellyn called The Basement. You know, we'd play shows there at like 5.30 in the afternoon. So we kind of did both of them, you know, but, uh, Greg wasn't as fast as, you know, I would have liked it. And our sound changed a lot with Greg, but, like, what, what I do, I'm in a band. I'm not, it's not like a solo project, even though I write the songs. So Greg changed our sound a lot, but that's what I wanted. You know, he's 33% of the band. So when he came in, we definitely changed our sound, but I was cool with it. You know, I didn't want to sound just, I didn't want him to be Carlos, you know. I wanted Greg to be Greg. And it's been, you know, it's perfect. And now he's like my best friend, so, you know, I couldn't ask for a better situation. Or, or 
or the, the way the scene has evolved from the mid-90s until now, since you've been you know, playing regularly all that time? Uh, I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, just the struggle of venues, you know, it's definitely gone up and down. Like, it hasn't, I wouldn't say it's affected us so much, but I've seen, like, you know, there used to be, I hate to use the word unity, but there used to be a, like a core of bands, you know, that would just stick together. Like, Eric, Black Jesus, gave us our first show ever in Norfolk, you know, so. And we've always been tight with them, and I always loved them to death, but we had a really strong alliance with Lost Tribe and Black Jesus, you know, we would just play around everywhere. And now we don't really have that with any local bands, you know. I mean, we always, I'm always looking to like what I would call like a dot bands or whatever, you know. We're trying to hook up whoever we can to help them out because Eric did that for us, so I, you know, pass it on or whatever. But I don't think there's this, there's like a core nucleus. Like, I mean, we're, we're, we're all like friends, you know. If we're not playing, we're drinking at the cantina, you know, you see us all the time. But there's not really like, I don't know. I just, it's not really as, and then a lot of bands also aren't doing all ages shows, you know, like which is kind of different. Like, a lot of kids don't know who, like, the bands that we would think are the hugest, you know, a lot of kids have no idea who they are, you know. They can't right, which is kind of upsetting, you know, and it makes no sense. Like, it's, you know, it's sad. Like, uh, I was at, uh, probably eight years ago when the uh, Candy Snatchers played for No Effects, and basically the whole crowd was, you know, under 21, and they didn't even know who the hell they were, you know, and it was just like, it was a bad scene, and I felt bad for those guys and everything. And they just want no effects to get on stage. Correct. You know, they had no idea who they were seeing, you know, or how badass these guys were, you know, like. But you got to, you know, you got to do the work. I mean, that's why, I mean, we don't do, we do all ages shows out of town, but we don't do them as much in town now because obviously we all like to drink. So I don't want to be that guy showing up with 16-year-old kids, you know, and I'm, you know, like that. I don't want to be that guy, so. But out of town, we play mostly all ages shows, but around here, we really don't. But I, I mean, the venues is probably the thing, you know. We, we don't really have that strong venue, you know, like, there's always been that one place, you know, like, and it seems like as soon as one closed, it picked up, like, 44 was great, you know. We could play there till three in the morning, you know, basically lawless. Then we had Sunset Grill, you know, Kogan's, which a lot of people took advantage of, you know, now it's like glorified as a great place, but Kind of like CB's, you know, in New York. People glorify it. But when, when we were playing there, exactly, it, when we were playing there, it was a shithole, you know? And that's the same thing we thought of Kogan's, you know? But once it gets closed, like, you kind of remember the good, but you forget the bad, you know? But I don't think, there's not that, there's not one place to where you know you can go every Friday and Saturday and see at least somebody, you know? Might not be great, but at least there's going to be a decent show, you know? We don't really have that. And thank God Norfolk, you know, they, they're picking it up where you know right now you know there's nowhere like I mean we can play pretty much where we want to but you have to pay me a hell of a lot of money to play the block right now you know that's just not gonna happen well, I remember you know back then um, I remember the Virginia Beach and Norfolk scene being very close right you know we would go out to report for all the time right and if there was a show here you would, it would be 50-50 beach people I mean we were all idiots too because we were driving drunk like right. up and down Right. Yeah. I mean. And I mean, that's another thing I don't get. Once again, like, I didn't grow up here, but I don't see much difference, you know. If you go on Virginia Beach Boulevard, you don't see the signs. You can't tell where Norfolk ends and Virginia Beach begins, you know. But yet, like you're saying, it takes a lot to get Norfolk people to the beach and vice versa, you know. And it makes no sense to me, you know. You'd rather sit on, you know, sit at your couch and hope something better happens. But, but as bands, I think we do that, you know. Like, don't get me wrong what I was saying before, like, it's a strong core, you know, it's almost like an incestuous relationship. We all borrow band members and stuff, and we all support each other. And the bands that don't support each other, like you're saying, those are the bands that have been around six, seven years, putting out records and still can't draw a dick on a Friday night, you know, because, I mean, I don't generally go to see bands around here because I think they're the greatest fucking thing in the world. They're my friends, you know, and that's what makes me happy. I, there's nothing better than to put a bigger smile on my face and see my friends kick ass on stage, you know. But it's not like I have to, oh my God, these guys are so great, I'm going to see them. It's because those are my boys, and they come support me. So if you don't support me, I'm probably not going to support you, you know. And there's bands like that, but that's why they can't do shit, you know, like. Question? Um, uh, I was, Burn It Down actually is really one of my faves. <laughs> I like that song. And uh, I was talking to my friend, and I go, 
It's a lot like Firehouse from Kiss, you know? It's really, well, they both have to do with fire. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just like, they're really simplistic right. lyrics, you right. know? But it's, it's, it's catchy. Uh, right. I was just like, you gotta hear this song, <laughs> it's burn it down. Yeah. It's, uh, what your writing style is, um, the, you know, can you tell us a little bit about There's that? two different ways I write songs, like, you know, the better ones, I think, come to me as words, you know, and then you add the music to them. But there's also, you know, riffs. Basically, they just, you know, I do what I do because that's who I am. You know, I don't do it for like, you know, don't get me wrong. We make probably better money than anyone around here and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I do it because that's who I am. You know, and people ask me when I'm going to stop. It's like, you know, I guess when I stop waking up, you know, like, I mean, what else am I going to do? You know, I don't do it for kicks. I don't do it for chicks. I don't do it for none of that. You know, I do it because it's in me. So it's like. It's like almost like an exorcism, you know, like releasing your demons or whatever on stage. But as far as writing style, I don't try to overthink it because like the kind of music I like, I call it all soul music, you know, whether it's the Ramones, Sam Cooke, you know, Thelonious Monk or whatever, you know, it's music that comes from here versus music that comes from there, you know. When you overthink it, I think you lose a lot of it, you know, and I try not to do that, you know. I don't overthink lyrics or riffs or anything like that, you know, it's just... And, what, you know, coming back to the whole band thing, like, how it is here, it never ends up like that, you know, for, you know, how it sounds to everybody else, because the band puts their input into it. You know, I come in and I'm like, da-da-da, do this or do that. But, you know, when they add great parts, you know, that's when it, you know, that's when it's a band, you know, and that's the greatest feel in the world. Like, when it starts from here, the first time you hear it, when you're practicing it, like, that's the best feeling in the world, you know, like, I mean, that's one of the main reasons I do it for it. Right. In a great way. Right, right. And I think a lot of bands, I mean, your friends with a lot of bands from out of town, they always look forward to coming and mm -hmm. they're kind of regulars here. Definitely. And so, what would you say um, were some of the attributes of this scene versus um, some of the other cities you play? I mean, it comes, it comes down to like a tight knit, you know, we're, we're all, you know, it doesn't matter. Like, I don't, you know, none of the bands around here get big heads, you know, because we all are so tight, you know, like, and if you do start, you know, it's going to be me or somebody else, you know, Eric, Darby, or any of us to say, you know, you know, look, motherfucker, what are you doing, you know, who are you to act like this, you know, who are you to ask for this much money, you know, what have you done, you know, let's compare resumes or whatever, so we kind of keep ourselves in check, and I think we all realize the importance of people like you, you know, like, a great scene has to have great bands, period, that's number one, but, you know, the documentation counts so much, you know, like, back to the differences, think how many zines we had like 13 years ago around here, you know, and now, you know, it's you guys doing it, but it's, I mean, I guess that's a zine, but it's, you know, it's not like a 13-year-old kid that's just so stoked on it, you know, that's, you know, like, yeah, and, you know, Xerox, and, you know, I mean, it was a lot more work back then, you know, it cost like $8 to even try and book a show, you know, out of town, you had to send your packet off, and postage was a motherfucker, you know, and now it's just like, look at my Facebook link, you know, and it creates like this almost like a false sense of who bands are, you know. You've got bands that have like 100,000 plays on MySpace that can't draw 20 motherfuckers, you know. It's like, it's like, creates like a fake sense of, you know. And along those lines, where do you think the kids are? Because there really don't seem to be, I mean, I know, I know the underage kids can't get in, but right. for example, the 20-somethings, like there aren't a whole lot of bands cropping up um, to be kind of successors. There aren't. It's like a... I mean, unfortunately, a lot of this town has come to, turned into like a, I, I call it like disco rave shit, you know, that's what it is. Like all the kids want to go out dancing on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and, you know, there aren't really many great young bands, period. You know, I don't know any great band under, that has a member under 30, you know, where the average members are under 30 and that's terrible. I'm getting kind of off track here, but going back to like, one of the great things about our scene is rock and roll bands and punk bands play together all the time versus like you know you're talking in dc like adam west great band but they you know punk bands don't really play together with them up there you know dc has a great punk scene but they don't really mix you know and down here there's really no separation you know so i think that has a lot to do with it and like you know we all respect each other so much like the core group you know 
there's always outsiders, you know. But the core group of musicians and artists respect each other so much that there's not really a wall between, you know, bands, you know, here, like from different genres. Whereas in, you know, New York, you know, you're not going to get like at the trash bar a hardcore band playing with like a, a garage punk band, you know. It just doesn't happen, you know. It's more like straight genre, you know. Yeah, right. You know, something unusual. Right, something unusual like that once a year. Whereas here we do it all the time, you know, like. And it means a lot more to a place like this because we don't, we're not overindulged with good shows, you know. So like, we'll look forward to a show for like a month, you know, whereas up there it's like, well shit, I got Motorhead on Monday, you know, <laughs> whoever on, you know, Independence on Tuesday, you know, there's just so much stuff up there. Whereas I think it means more to us, you know, because we don't get as much of it. Right. And there'd be like three shows I could see at night. I'm like, well, I'll just stay home because I can't decide. Um, but here, you, you start looking forward to something three weeks ahead right. of time or, you know. An anticipation. Yeah. Right. And you build it up and you talk shit online, you know, and all that. So, you know, it makes it <laughs> fun. Okay. Right. Yeah, it makes it fun, you know. Yeah. It does. And it's a core cool group. And like, like I was saying earlier, you know, I think, like, we don't see much difference between what you guys are doing and what we're doing, you know, as far as, like, I wouldn't even know what to call you, critics or whatever the hell. Like, I'll call you, like, you document the scene. I'm not saying this because this is a document. You know, I'm saying. Uh, kind of like historic art. Right. Archives. All right. And I've always looked at the same. You know, like zine writers. You know, 13 year old kids. I look at them no different than what we're doing because it takes everything to make a great scene. People that show up to all the shows. You know, I mean, there's like 50 people that come to every fucking show. You know, the same people. And you know, that's what it takes. You know, because I mean, that's the difference between punk and you know different genres to me is like. We're going to play the same no matter what. Like, we're going to put our hearts out every fucking night. You know, we're going to leave everything on stage. But it's when the crowd, that's when they become great. It's like a 50-50 mutual relationship, you know. We're giving all we got. When the crowd gives it all they got, that's when you got something magic right there. I got to say, I was pretty happy when I saw your post about, um, the, uh, you know, like, you filled up 45 minutes before the damn hit first band. So I was like, that's what I want to see. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's great, but we can't, like... Like I was saying earlier, we're like small places like this because then bad shit happens, you know. Yeah. Like, so we kind of like try and DL it. Like on Kogan's, we would do like secret shows almost, you know, because we didn't want there to be too many people there because that's when problems happen, you know. What would, your, what would you say your hope is for the, for the scene? I mean, you're obviously not retiring anytime soon. You shouldn't be. No. I mean, I, like we were saying earlier, I would like to see more bands get involved. You know, I always tell people that I hate the whole idolization thing. That freaks me out, you know, like, when I'll be, and I can see it coming from a mile away. Like, say we were just sitting here talking, someone, a girl or guy will come up there and we'll be in a, a circle having a conversation. Someone will just stand there looking at their feet. And I know what the fuck they're about to do. They're just waiting for a break. And they're like, hey, aren't you this, this? And that shit kind of freaks me out, you know, like, like when someone asks for your autograph, you know, I'm like, you know, I'd rather have a conversation with you and tell you why it's wrong to idolize somebody, you know. It's just totally wrong, you know. Like, when you play a place like the Norva, the first time we played there, there was, I mean, and this sounds fucked up, and it is fucked up, but there was, like, three girls crying in the front row, you know, as we're playing. And I stopped the show, because you know how, like, when it gets packed, you think someone's getting pressed against the barricade? You know, I was like, are you all right? They're like, yeah, you guys are awesome. I was like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? Like, seriously, like, I'm going to work tomorrow. Like, what the fuck, you know I mean? I'm no different than you, you know, grab a guitar. Play, learn it. Fuck Guitar Hero, fuck all that shit, you know. Play it. While you're pushing those three buttons, you could be using two extra fingers and you got a band, you know. It's not that hard. But I wish bands around here would go out of town more. And I tell all my friends that. If it wasn't for Black Lung and Dave Austin's label, most people would have never heard of any bands around here besides the Candy Snatchers and us. Because, because we put the work in. Because we put the work in, you know. So God bless those guys. But if it wasn't for them, no one would ever. And there's, there's bands that. I think even Larry would say there's bands, and I'll, I'll say for damn sure, there's bands more talented than Dustin around here, you know, but people don't know them, even like an hour away, because they haven't put the work in, you know. And to me, that's how you test your band. You can play in front of your friends for a year straight, and they're going to tell you what friends tell you, like, oh, you're great, you're great. But when you're eight hours away from home, and you have no money to get home, and you have to play for your, your fucking gas to get home, that's how you know when your band's good, you know. How do you attack 200 strangers? versus like 50 of your friends, you know.
And I wish bands would put in more of the work, you know. But it's hard, you know. It's not easy, you know. But the more you do it, the easier it becomes, you know. Well, it just became obvious to me the other day on the line. I was thinking, you know, why don't more bands come here? And it's because we don't have bands going out right. scouting. Exactly. Like, the more well, bands tour and they meet people and they say, you got to come out. Oh, yeah, that's true. It's you gotta crazy. Get you got to come back here. Exactly. Uh, the geography excuse. No. Yeah, but I don't. I mean, I don't agree. Like, we never play a show locally without an out-of-town band. It's always a band that we've met, you know, and that we play kick-ass shows, whatever city they're in, you know. And you trade off, you form like alliances, and that makes that band bigger here, and it makes your band bigger there, you know. And I mean, the best thing I've gotten out of this, you know, when I die or whatever, will be all the friendships. You know, that's what means the most to me. You know, like I've had. I mean. I mean, we laugh together, we drink together, we have fun, but we also, we bury our own together, you know, we cry together, you know, like, that's some of my best friends, you know, and that's what I'll take with me to my grave, you know, and that's the best thing I've ever gotten out of this. And can you tell us um, some war stories, like you were starting to tell us the story <laughs> that came around? Uh, I mean, uh, we've got a, a shitload of them. Uh, we're at the Tap House right now, and uh, I want to say it was five or six years ago, Black Jesus was doing a reunion show. They hadn't played in probably four or five years. Jay was out. He had kind of dropped out. I'm not sure what was going on there, but, you know, I miss him. I love Jay to death. But he was coming back in, so, you know, we were like, you know, we're going to play with you guys, so it was great. Well, as we are playing, and, you know, it was, like, ridiculously, this is back before they even really checked the door. Like, I don't even think they checked capacity back then. It was different, you know, a little bit more lawless or whatever. So as we are playing, um, all of a sudden you see like a huge, I mean, it looks like a tornado coming out of here from the back room. And you can't tell from the stage to the back what happened. But the gist of it is somebody just for looking wrong or whatever caught a cue ball to the nose multiple times, you know. So right in the middle of our set, and it's not the first time, but whenever you see guys in helmets and face masks show up, you know, regular cops are bad enough. But when you see the cops with the helmets, that's when it's serious fucking shit. And that's what this was. And, uh, German Shepherd on the right, German Shepherd on the left. Jeff Mazie even made a quote about to where he's been to a thousand shows, but he's never seen a police presence on the stage with German Shepherds on both sides like that. Right. And the word is, I don't know if this is true, but the fire marshal said, you don't have to close the show because there was a fight, but you have to close because there's too much blood for you to be allowed to serve food. And that's how bad it was. Right. None of us got paid, and it was, you know, it's shitty. You know, I, I don't want to be the band that's, you know, you know, don't get me wrong, I'll throw down and die for the right cause, you know, like, for the right shit. But for someone looking wrong or whatever, that's just bullshit. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm never, we're not a jock band, you know, we never have been. And, and play whatever sport you want, but don't bring that shit. Don't let your fun interfere with someone else's fun, you know. It's not about who's cooler or who's tougher, you know. We've never been about that. But a lot of people bring that into it. And that's like a, we fought that down forever. I mean, we've had riot cops and... D.C., Raleigh, I mean, almost basically any city we've played a bunch of times, like, shit's gotten bad, you know. And, but that gives you a lot of good material, so, you know, as far as songs and stuff, you know. And a lot of my friends are cops. I don't hate cops at all, you know, by any means, you know. You get some of my dickhead friends, you know. And, you know, but when we started, there was actually, you know, which I was shocked coming from where I was from, there was a kind of a big Nazi presence around here 15 years ago. Like at uh, Tux. And uh, Lost Tribe can tell you war stories. Right before he moved here, they were getting, I can't remember who they played with at uh, Tux, but they got some, not Tux, the King's Head. What the fuck am I saying? At the King's Head. But they got called some slurs and shit and all this stuff. So that was the, if nothing else, and it wasn't me personally, but it was people that I'm down with and myself that ran all those motherfuckers out. You know, that's one thing I would not put up with. Like, I'm not going to have a goose stepping, ignorant motherfucker at my shows, period. I'll give you your money back. You know, I used to think the best thing to do was like break someone's jaw like that because you can't sing fucking Sig Heil through fucking wires, you know what I'm saying? But now it's like, that's just going to make them worse, you know? They're just going to hate people like me worse. So now I just, I'd rather have you get your money back and leave. And the last time we saw a presence was like at the Riverview, probably 12 or 13 years ago, and they got surrounded by probably 55 people. And the bouncers freaked out like, you guys are crazy. We're like, no, we're not crazy, but you need to get these motherfuckers out of here because we got the power, you know what I'm saying? Like, but I mean... We'll throw down for anything, like, all ages show, a bouncer's fucking up a kid, we're gonna stop, and we're gonna fucking, it's on, you know what I'm saying? We're not never gonna let anyone take advantage of someone that's 
we're grateful for people paying money to see us, you know. So I'm never going to let them get taken advantage of, regardless. You know, I take that shit seriously, you know. Is that Riverview show, by the way, was it the Murphy's Law show? Or was it around that time? It had... Well, they were open for like a, a year and a half, and then another guy took it over probably like a year later for like six months or something. If I remember it, um, in fact, we're going to meet up with um, Kevin Johnson tomorrow. I remember we went and saw a war at Peppermint Beach Club. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, that's the problem with, like, hardcore gangs are, like, the biggest bitch gangs in the world because it's always 15 on one, and you're, I mean, basically, dude, you're punking down, like, 12-year-old rich kids. Like, I mean, you want to be a fucking gang. Like, I know gangs, dude. I got motherfucking gang friends, you know. Like, go take your little gang against these motherfuckers, you know. It's not going to happen, you know. Like, it's just, it's kind of like that high school bullying shit, you know. Pick on the freshmen and all that shit, and I fucking hate it because, I mean, there's two ways you get into this. Either you didn't fit in somewhere else, or, you know, your parents are open-minded enough to let you, like, experience whatever you wanted to, you know. None of us were born with black flag tattoos, you know. We all worked our way into this, you know. So, I, you know, I, I, you know, I cherish anyone that comes out to see us, and I will, you know, I'll throw down for any of them. I'll never let anyone get taken advantage of that. Like, I do take that shit seriously, you know. Fun is fun, but I don't let people fuck with other people like that. Uh, no, Trey, I think... Uh, 25, 26 minutes is great. <laughs> Thanks. Do you, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, yeah. Do you have anything? Uh, um, I just want to say how important it is, like, the bands that helped us out from the get-go, bands like Lost Tribe and Black Jesus, like that, you know, those are the, that's why we still do it. And, you know, as long as it matters to other people, oh, fuck, I don't, I'm going to be doing it whether it matters to other people or not, you know what I'm saying? If people, if my band becomes irrelevant, I'm still going to be doing it, you know? I'll be sitting on my couch and maybe just playing for my girl or whatever, but still going to be doing it, you know. But adopt bands, other bands from around here, please take your shit on the road, you know, test what you have out. You never know what you have until you put it to the test, you know, so. And people say it's going to happen in Norfolk, but the only way it's going to happen in Norfolk is if we make it happen, you know, and that's, you can't expect someone to come discover you, you know, those days, that's like some Hollywood fantasy or whatever, you know, like, you have to go to people if you want a crowd, you know, so. And I'm just fortunate, you know, I've gotten everything I ever wanted out of music, you know. I've gotten to play with all the heroes I grew up with. Been in the car with my six-year-old niece when my songs come on the radio, you know, and she's freaking out, you know, which doesn't matter to me, kind of weird to me, but, you know, it's awesome to see that effect on her, you know, and uh, I've gotten everything I wanted out of it. And we love Norfolk, and Norfolk shapes our sound, and, you know, hopefully we have, you know, a lot of people move on to New York or D.C. or... Chicago or LA, but I would never leave because I feel like we play an important part here, you know, so we love Norfolk as much as Norfolk loves us.